Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Invasive Species Center uh, webinar series. My name is Madison McKegg. I'm the aquatic specialist at the Invasive Species Center, and I'll be your moderator for today. I'm speaking to you today from Sault Ste. Marie, and I would like to acknowledge that this is Robinson Huron Treaty Territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, home of Garden River First Nation, Batchewana First Nation, and the Métis Nation. I'm just going to go over a quick introduction of the Invasive Species Center before introducing our speaker. The Invasive Species Center is a not-for-profit organization that connects stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. There are a lot of great resources available on our website, including species profiles, best management practices, and video resources. So check us out at invasivespeciescenter.ca. Also on our website, you can sign up to receive our newsletter, bi-weekly media scan, and event invitations, including future webinars. I also wanted to mention that this week is Invasive Species Awareness Week, which is a collaborative initiative focused on communicating with citizens and organizations about invasive species through social media. Um, you can participate by liking, sharing, or retweeting any posts created by participating organizations or by creating your own posts. So far, the campaigns have generated over 450,000 impressions. So let's keep this momentum going and keep sharing. Um, and you can find out more information about this on our website as well. Um, so before we get started with today's webinar, there's a couple of housekeeping items that I'd like to mention. First, there will be time for questions at the end of the webinar. So if you have a question at any time, please type it in the question box and I will read it to our presenter after the webinar. If you're having any technical difficulties, please type them in the question box as well, or respond to the email found in your registration, and we will try to resolve that for you. Lastly, there will be a very brief survey following the webinar. If you could take some time to fill that out, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, now, today's webinar is titled Assessing the Risk of Oak Wilt in Canada, Climate Suitability and Potential Economic Impacts. And I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, John Pedlar. John has a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Guelph and a Master of Science from Carleton University. He's been employed as a forest landscape biologist at the Great Lakes Forestry Centre in Sault Ste. Marie since 1999, with over 20 years of forestry experience. John's work focuses on how climate change and invasive species impact forest ecosystems and their related socioeconomic values. Today, he'll be talking to you about a recent effort to assess the potential economic impacts of oak wilt in Canada. Thank you for joining us today, John, and I will let you take it from here. Well, hello, everyone. It's nice to be joining you virtually today. I'd like to start just by thanking Madison and Deb and the team there at Invasive Species Center for making this happen. So just to start, a little context about myself. I'm part of a multidisciplinary group at Great Lakes Forestry Centre called the Integrated Ecology and Economic Section. Um, we're also located in, in Sault Ste. Marie, right literally attached to the Invasive Species Centre. Um, and we've got quite a broad range of research topics that we're interested in, including spatial climate modelling, climate change impacts and adaptations, plant hardiness modelling, species distribution modelling, economic assessments, and invasive species risk assessments, which I'll be talking about today. It's quite a, as I mentioned, quite a broad range of research interests, and um, that's really a testament to uh, the broad interests and, and drive of our leader, Dan McKenney. If you know Dan, you'll know that of which I speak. But if you're looking for a theme there, really climate data is at the basis for much of the work we do, and it will certainly feature in my talk today. So I mentioned we've uh, done some economic analyses related to invasive forest pests. Uh, we've done several related to emerald ash borer, uh, also the Asian longhorn beetle. And today I'll be talking about our recent study that came out in scientific reports assessing the climate suitability and potential economic impacts of oak wilt in Canada. Just mentioned that uh, you know the first three authors on that paper were all from uh, Great Lakes Forestry Center, and then Sharon Reed is from Oak Ridge, just across the parking lot from us. 
and John Sweeney is from the Atlantic Forestry Center in Frederick. So before talking about oak wilt, I just like to take a second to talk about oaks in Canada. There's uh, 10 species of oak across the country. Nine of those are in the eastern portion of the country and one species, the endangered Gary oak, is found in uh, British Columbia. So it's, uh, oaks are important species in natural settings where they tend to form mixtures with other hardwood species. Um, they provide habitat and important food source for wildlife. And then in the in the urban settings, they're often prized uh, yard trees and street trees. Um, wood uh, wood from oaks is is really renowned for its strength and durability. So shown on the map here are oak volumes across the country. Uh, this is a product that we've relied on heavily for this work. So as I go, if I refer to the NFI grids, um, this is the the type of product that I'm talking about. And it was developed by Andre Baudouin and colleagues at the Laurentian Forestry Center in Quebec. So what is oak wilt? Well, I realize many of you probably know more about oak wilt per se than I do, but for, for anyone who's not overly familiar with it, uh, oak wilt is a disease caused by the fungus Brettsiella fagaceiarum. And it attacks the xylem or sapwood of oak trees. Um, in so doing, it blocks the flow of, of water and nutrients and causes a defensive response in the host, the production of gums and such that actually end up sort of further choking off the xylem flow. So in some cases, death can occur quite rapidly and researchers have found that there's sort of a difference between um, different groups of oaks in terms of how the disease progresses. For red oaks, the red oak group, which includes about 80 species across uh, South and North America, and includes what we know of as red oak here in Northern Ontario, mort mortality can happen quite quickly, uh, even within sort of weeks of when the initial symptoms appear. And, and typically the, the disease causes the death of the tree. For um, species in the white oaks group, which includes about 100 species around the world, um, the, the disease progression is much slower and in some cases doesn't result in the death of the tree. So how can oak wilt be transmitted? Well, there's three main ways. For oak trees growing in close proximity, um, their roots actually often come in contact and can, and can form root grafts where the, the roots actually fuse together and xylem fluids then can actually be exchanged between the trees. Unfortunately, if one of those trees has Brettsiella fagaceiarum growing on it, the spores can then also pass with that xylem fluid into the neighboring trees and cause the disease. For longer distance spread, say up to a few kilometers, this is typically carried out by insects uh, known as sap beetles from the family Nitidulidae. And uh, these beetles actually feed on the fungus. Um, as the fungus progresses, it pushes through the, the bark of the tree and apparently has an odor to it, a fairly strong odor that is attractive uh, to, to wildlife, particularly these, these sap beetles. So they feed on, on the fungal mats and in so doing, they get covered in the spores and then carry those spores to other trees. And uh, long distance uh, transport uh, on the scale of hundreds or even thousands of kilometers typically involves human movement of infected materials such as log and firewood. So I wanted to talk a little bit about management options as far as you know what can be done to um, slow the spread and to reduce the impacts of oak wilt. At this point, it's well established in North America, so eradicating it is, is very likely out of the question. But uh, certainly one of the things they suggest if oak wilt shows up and starts killing trees in an area is to, uh, to cut those trees as quickly as possible and dispose of the materials um, in a way that's not gonna further spread the fungus either through burning or covering them with plastic on site. Um, as far as uh, spread by insect vectors, then uh, those sap beetles that I talked about require trees with open wounds uh, for feeding on, or that's what they're looking for anyway. They don't create their own wounds to feed at. So if, if people can avoid uh, pruning or 
cutting or damaging trees during the spring and summer when those beetles are most active, that can be an effective way to really reduce the spread of oak wilt. And as with many other invasive forest species, we hear about the mantra of don't move firewood, and that again applies equally well here. As far as disrupting root to root spread, there's been success um, using heavy equipment to actually create uh, trenches and break up any root connections. Uh, shown here is a vibratory plow that essentially uh, cuts a four foot deep trench. Um, they've had good success with that in the United States, but I do sort of wonder about how well it would work in a lot of the soils here in Canada, perhaps in, you know, in southern Ontario, it might have some, some use for sure. Um, and finally, uh, chemical fungicide treatments can be, can be applied. Um, the main treatment is a fungicide called propicanazole, and it doesn't prevent trees from getting oak well, but it does delay the symptoms and it reduces mortality significantly. However, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, a treatment that needs to be injected by these injectors, which are relatively costly. And they need to be repeated every two years. So it's, it's not likely uh, an approach that's going to be widely used, but more for specific high value trees. Where did oak wilt come from? Well, this is a bit of a mystery. It was first described in Wisconsin in 1942, but it's thought to have arrived sometime in the 1800s from a single introduction event, possibly from Mexico or South America. There have been no reported occurrences of oak wilt in Canada, dot, 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 yet, <laughs> but um, it is certainly right at our doorstep. And in fact, um, environmental or eDNA of oak wilt has been found in monitoring traps along the Ontario border in recent years. So this doesn't necessarily mean that the fungus is established here yet, but it does mean that it's being moved into the area probably by those insect vectors. It seems like it would just be a matter of time then before those vectors find suitable oak tree uh, and the process starts on our side of the border. But I mean, I guess, we can be hopeful that it doesn't. So I'd like to switch gears now and talk about some findings from our study, uh, starting with the climate suitability aspect of our work. So for these analysis, we, uh, we obtained up-to-date information on oak wilt distribution in the United States from the U.S. Forest Service. This is the, the map shown here and on the previous slide that shows counties where oak wilt has been identified. We also obtained distribution data for two of the main insect vectors for oak wilt spread. That's uh, Coleopterus truncatus and Carpophilus sei. We then generated climate estimates at each of those occurrence locations for four climate variables that are thought to be important for oak wilt survival and spread. And those climate variables are listed here, fall precipitation, spring temperature, annual climate moisture index, and minimum temperature of the coldest month. So then we, we uh, used two approaches for generating species distribution models. We used Aneuclin, which is sort of an older generation approach that basically simply summarizes the climate at the occurrence locations. Things like minimum, maximum values, fifth to 95th percentiles, and then it maps where those climate conditions are found. With Maxent, it's a more a modern approach that uses machine learning to essentially identify an optimal uh, distribution that contrasts climate at the occurrence locations against climate across the whole study area. So in, our, in, in order to incorporate climate change into our study, uh, we use those species distribution models from the previous slide that were developed using current uh, climate data. And we resolved them using grids of future climate for those same four climate variables. And the climate change projections were based on an ensemble of four GCMs that I've listed here under a moderate emission scenario known as RCP 4.5 and for two future time periods for 2011 to 2040 and 2041 to 27. 
So with, with all that as sort of a preamble, this slide actually shows results from our climate suitability analysis for B. fagaciarum. Map A shows the occurrence data that was used for modeling the species. And note that we broke the full data set into training data to develop the model and testing data to see how accurate the model was in predicting new data points. And then Map B shows the climate suitability for B. fagaciarum under recent or current climate conditions. Uh, the colored contours show the max and outputs with the warmer colors, the, the reds and oranges and yellows uh, associated with the most favorable climate conditions for the fungus. The stippling overlaid on that shows the climate envelope derived by the annuclim analysis. And the hatched area across the southern part of eastern Canada shows the range of oak in Canada. So I'm not sure how clear it is on your screens. It would show up nicely on a on a large screen if we were together in the same room, but but there is uh, already a significant amount of climate suitable climate. Uh, so you know oranges, yellows, greens, and some blues in southern Ontario, showing that you know not surprisingly really climate is already there for oak wilt. And as the century progresses in maps C and D, we see that. Um, that much of the oak range in Canada is projected to become climatically suitable for oak wilt, certainly by the middle of the century. So these are similar results for one of the key insect vectors known as Colopterus truncatus. Again, map A shows the distribution data for this species. And I'd just like to acknowledge the contributions of co-authors Sharon Reed and John Sweeney in obtaining this data. Um, and in this case, we see that suitable climate habitat exists for this vector uh, really in all time periods that we considered. Similarly, for another key vector species, Carpophilus sei, uh, uh, suitable climate is uh, available across pretty much the whole range of oak in Canada for all three time periods. So uh, I guess, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like there's going to be any um, uh, saving uh, by, by climate in the case of oak wilt or these, these insect vectors. So I'd like to switch gears again and talk now about our analysis of economic impacts associated with oak wilt. I mean, there are many potential values that could be considered when talking about you know, the value of a tree species like oak. Our approach was to use a reduced set of values that we felt most confident about estimating. So this included costs associated with the removal and replacement of street trees, lost uh, timber revenues, and a preliminary analysis related to lost ecosystem services. So as far as the street tree impacts go, we made use of a street tree survey that we've been working on for several years. This survey uh, first started off as a field-based survey, but we soon realized that the same information could be obtained uh, using Google Street View imagery. And basically what the survey involves is virtually walking a sample of 500 meter street sections in each urban area. And as you're walking along, you identify all trees within 10 meters of the roadway to species if possible, and if not, hopefully to genus, and place them into uh, three rough size categories, small, medium, and large. To date, we've um, done surveys in about 150 urban areas across Canada. Uh, the green dots on this map show surveys, uh, so communities that we've completed all the uh, surveys in. Uh, the blue dots show that some some proportion of the uh, desired number of surveys have been completed there. We feel like our accuracy rates are pretty good. Uh, certainly there's some challenges with identifying things using Google Street View. The resolution is only so good. Um, I know, uh, you know we have we have some great people working on this. Um, I know that it can be frustrating for them sometimes as they're trying to get in and look at you know, the, the leaf structure on, on a tree and, and the resolution just isn't enough for them to see the features they need to make a, 
a good species identification, but but we've done testing and we found that uh, we're sort of running greater, closer to 80% at the species level, level and greater than 90% at the genus level. And it's really the genus level that matters for a lot of these invasive species because they attack all the species in the genus. So, in order to uh, you know, estimate removal and replacement costs, we needed to have a tree level estimates of, of what it costs to remove and replace them. Um, so in order to do that, we uh, carried out a survey of arborists and uh, posted internet rates. And we came up with this table of, of uh, estimated removal and replacement costs. We've included the range of variation into our, our ultimate cost calculations to give a sense of the uncertainty around these values. But you can see there that uh, you know for removal for a small tree less than five meters high, uh, average removal cost we, we put in is about $300. Replacement cost about $400 in each case. And um, total costs for small trees, uh, removal and replacement around $700. For medium trees, $900. And for large trees, $1,600. So the math on these impacts is pretty straightforward. So I wanted to work through an example for you using the city of Sault Ste. Marie. So from our urban tree surveys, we obtained estimates of oak density for each of our three size classes, in particular 0 0.07, 0 0.49, and 1.59 trees per kilometer for small, medium, and large trees, respectively. We were then able to obtain uh, from a GIS layer of Canadian road system, we were able to estimate the uh, total length of road for the city. Note that that has to be in two directions since trees grow on both sides of the street. It's then simply a matter of multiplying uh, the tree density values by the road length to get the total number of trees in that size class and then uh, multiplying that by the per tree uh, removal costs. And so that we did that for each of the three size categories. And then we uh, calculated the replacement costs as the total number of trees times total number of trees per kilometer. Uh, I should say total number of oak trees per kilometers times the uh, length of road times the cost of replacing the tree. And for our, for our base scenario, we just looked at a 50% replacement rate. But we also looked at um, zero and 100% replacement rates as well. So when all those numbers are, are in and, and summed up, we get a, an estimate of about 2.5 million for uh, costs associated with removal and replacement of oak trees in Sault Ste. Marie. So when we uh, follow that same approach for the remaining urban centers in Eastern Canada, our total removal and replacement costs range from uh, about 266 to 420 million dollars with an average of approximately 350 million dollars. The variation shown in this figure is, is related to a few things. First of all, to those uh, different replacement rates that I talked about. The blue uh, bars are associated with, with the zero percent replacement, 50 percent replacement is the red bars, and then the uh, green bars are the 100% replacement rates. Um, but within each of those replacement rates, we also have some variation related to the uncertainty around those, uh, those cost estimates, replacement and uh, removal cost estimates, and also uncertainty around the street tree density estimates. So we incorporated that uncertainty via the at-risk add-on uh, software. So this table shows the top 20 urban centers as far as estimated impacts from oak wilt on street tree removal and replacement costs. Not surprisingly, the, uh, the most impacted centers would be expected to be uh, large centers that have a lot of road length and have uh, a good number of oak trees on their streets. So large centers like Montreal, Toronto, Halifax, Quebec City. And uh, note that Sault Ste. Marie did make it onto the list as number 20, uh, you know, not a, not a huge center, but a good number of oaks along the streets. So we were also interested in estimating potential losses associated with timber values. 
And one way to do this is using stumpage fees, which are fees paid by forest, forestry companies to harvest timber on crown lands. So in this sense, they are an estimate of value associated with forests. So these fees vary by province, by tree species, wood quality, and product type. So we spent a fair bit of time uh, tracking down representative, what we, what we felt or were hope are representative oak-related stumpage fees in each province or each region in, in the case of the Maritimes. So um, we obtained gross, gross merchantable volumes for oaks greater than 40 years in each of these provinces or regions from that NFI uh, oak volume grid that I showed you earlier in the presentation. We then multiplied those gross merchantable volumes by the stumpage fees that we tracked down and were able to come up with regional standing timber values for oak. Sum those up and we get a value of about 126 million for standing oak timber in Canada. Uh, another approach for uh, estimating oak related timber value is via GDP which is a measure of the uh, total economic activity associated with a given industry or product. So in this case, we were able to obtain broad forestry-related GDP values uh, from the NRCAN website shown here, and that provided the values in the first column of this table. But the challenge is, is then finding how much of that total GDP is related to oak in particular. So we um, did literature searches to first uh, track down the estimates of the proportion of harvest related to hardwoods in each, in each province. That's the second column in this table. And we then uh, expressed oak abundance as a proportion of the total hardwoods in each of those regions using that NFI product again. So that's the third column in this table. So with those two multipliers, we're able to sort of take general forest-related GDP and zero in on what is hopefully more the, the oak-related um, aspect of that GDP. And that's the final uh, column in this table. Unfortunately, the bottom, bottom uh, row of that table I don't think is probably showing up on your screens and that shows the total but if we if we sum up those regional values we get approximately 25 million per year associated with oak related GDP. So we also carried out what I'm calling a preliminary analysis of ecosystem service values related to runoff and pollution control and carbon sequestration. So our approach here was to obtain total oak volumes from the NFI grids again for each of six age classes across Eastern Canada. And that is the first volume or the first column in this table. We then estimated average uh, tree volume for each of these age classes using uh, volume age equations. Using so for using those uh, first two columns, uh, we're able to calculate the total estimated number of trees in each of those age classes across eastern Canada. So needless to say, there are some big error bars on this kind of uh, calculation, but uh, there are the numbers there in the third column of the table um, so if you know someone says hey how many oak trees are there in eastern canada you could actually tell them there's a 181 million 982 thousand eight hundred and six um, not sure how often you'll need that bit of trivia but that's that's our best estimate at it anyway anyway once we come up with those uh, tree numbers we're able to multiply by um, per tree benefit values, annual per tree benefit values that we obtained from the USFS iTree application. So that gave us uh, the total annual benefits for each of these age classes. If we sum those across age classes, we arrive at a value of about $41 million per year in these uh, set of ecosystem services. 
So I've talked about uh, sort of three different cost categories. How do we pull it all together to say, you know, here's a here's a here's a number that that uh, sums up economic impacts associated with oak weld? Well, um, we talked about that 350 million dollar value for street trees, 160 million dollars for standing timber associated with the uh, the stumpage fees. Then we get to ecosystem services, and our estimate there was in in um, dollars per year so if we looked at that dollars per year as sort of a, a perpetuity that we would that we would receive in the absence of oak weld sort of into the future um, one way of converting a perpetuity into present value is to divide by the discount rate or the interest rate and if we do that we get a value we, we can convert that 41 million per year into a present value of about one billion dollars if we add in those other costs then we're looking at a, a total risk a number uh, uh, associated with the values associated with oak of about 1.5 billion dollars So needless to say, there's lots of caveats to, the, to this work. It's it's pretty hard to do economic work related to in, invasive species without without having some caveats. Certainly, the missing cost categories that I've alluded to are are, are real. Um, shade provision, recreational values, wildlife habitat are all things that that have value, but it's very challenging to put uh, actual dollar dollar values on those values. Uh, we also didn't consider a timeline for oak wilt spread, which would allow us to appropriately uh, discount um, the costs associated with oak wilt, um, provided, you know, essentially providing a timeline associated with those costs. But we just felt like, um, you know, estimating oak wilt spread would involve such a large amount of conjecture that we felt more comfortable just leaving it out. The equation at this point. We also didn't consider behavioral responses by the forest industry, such as preemptive cutting, salvage harvesting, and substitution. And uh, finally, we didn't, you know, incorporate economic costs and benefits associated with management actions that, that might be undertaken if oak wilt does start to show up in Canada. So I guess suffice to say that much more complex analyses could be undertaken, but we hope that this study is a step towards understanding the values at risk in the event of an oak wilt introduction into Canada. So in summary, um, it does look like there's suitable climate for oak wilt and its insect vectors in Canada across much of the oak range within the next 30 years. Um, based on estimates from our urban tree survey, you know, roughly 30, $350 million associated with removal and replacement of street trees, and roughly maybe $126 million associated with standing oak wilt or standing oak timber, and then $41 million per year or $1 billion when expressed as a present value of perpetuity in um, ecosystem service values. So, you know, these estimates underline the importance of monitoring and, and ongoing management efforts. And you know, I guess I guess overall, the, the, we hope the take home message is that there's a lot of value in Oaks. And I think that uh, this is an important message to convey to management agencies and uh, to the general public. Thanks for listening. That was great. Thank you so much, John. Um, we can take any questions now, so if you want to uh, type them in the question box and I will uh, read them out to John. We have a few that have um, come in already. Um, so John, one question here, what is the probability of mortality uh, once infected? Okay. Um... That's a good question. I'm not sure I actually have the answer to that. Uh, what I can say is that the probability of mortality is very much dependent on the type of oak. So I talked about those that red oak group and the white oak group. Um, my impression is that with the red oak group, 
the um, probability of mortality is very high. I don't know that it's 100%, but it's 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 upwards of that. Uh, with the whiteout group, I'm not sure. I know that um, that recovery is is certainly something that that can happen, but I, I don't know about the, the rate that it happens with the, the white oak. So I'd be happy to, to get back to the person if I can about that, but I don't have that particular number off the top of my head. There might Sounds be other good. people listening in who know it, so feel free to, to uh, respond on the chat and we can respond that way. Thanks, John. Yeah. Um... The next one here, does the U.S. Forestry Service iTree application consider that trees can become a carbon source rather than a carbon sink when they are respiring more than photosynthesizing? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I'm trying to think back to the reading I've done. It's been a while since I've been on iTree. The number that they provide there is is sort of a, a net value. So I'm assuming that they, they do take into account the, the sort of you know, pluses and minuses around a, you know, a, an average situation, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, um, where some trees are more of a, a carbon sink than others. Um, but I would have to actually look you know, more closely into those, those I tree values to, to get back on that. That's a good question. Okay. Um, do you know if they're continuing to plant oak trees in the United States? Hmm. I don't know for sure. I I think they're feeling fairly fairly good about their management approach. I don't think you know they've they've sort of given up on the oak resource in the United States. Uh, so I would assume they are still planting oak there. I mean, particularly uh, species from the, the white oak group seem like they'd be a reasonable bet. Um, they also have a lot more oak species to choose from in the United States. I think upwards of 50 or 60 species there in total. So uh, um, yeah, I guess I guess my my sense is that that uh, that oaks, particularly in that white oak group, would still be planted there. Okay. Um, so, did your urban tree survey include um, trees on residential properties as well, or natural areas, or was it um, strictly strictly the street trees? Well, it included. It included any trees within 10 meters of the roadway. So that would include both um, city owned trees and privately owned trees. Um, we, we use that cutoff for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, that's really about as far as you can accurately estimate, estimate uh, using Google Street View. You can't really see into people's backyards, for example. Um, and we also felt like these are trees that would that would definitely have to be dealt with in the event of their their death, uh, whereas you know trees and woodlots um, uh, might not have to be actually harvested. They might be able to just uh, die naturally and fall down. Um, it would be great to get estimates that extend into uh, you know other green spaces, but. Uh, we, you know, we haven't been able to find a method to get those numbers yet. Thanks, John. Uh, so we have lots of questions coming in here, so I'm trying to try my best to work through them all. Um, next one, with replacing the tree, uh, won't they just get infected by oak wilt again, especially if the disease can be passed on via roots? Yeah, I mean, if it was, if it was my Woodlot or my uh, plantation, and I was I was uh, making choices around that. No quilt was in the area. I, I would be reticent to replant with oak, but um, you know I might consider it for some of these oak wilt species from the oak wilt group. But yeah, I, I would I would think twice about it for sure. Thank you. 
Um, have there been any trees that have been found to be uh, resistant and could be a basis for a genetic fight? Mm -hmm. uh, just trying to think if I've read anything about that. I am not sure about genetic resistance. Uh, that would certainly be something that they are looking into in, on the US side, I'm sure. But, um, you know, it would be something that would take a, a number of years for sure, decades really, to, to develop resistant strains. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that if that work was underway um, but i'm not aware of you know, where they are in that process okay um we do have someone on the line uh here that said once a, a red oak gets infected the mortality is uh 100 and i do think that's that's different for uh white oaks right yeah sure. um Okay, next question. Um, once established, would you say eradication is possible? Um, well, I no, I don't think so. I mean, you might be able to sort of root out oak wilt from your particular woodlot. Um, it's in the grand scheme, as I mentioned, I don't think eradication is going to be possible, certainly at a continental scale. Uh, it's well established and would be pretty much impossible to to stop at this point. But, um, you know, if if one was to remove from from, you know, from a local situation, from a from a woodlot situation, if you were to get cutting and removing those materials as quickly as possible, possibly, uh, you know, getting into the trenching to break up the roots. Um, you, I, I know there are success stories from the United States for sure. It's not like it's, uh, it's impossible. I do wonder in the case of certainly in our northern, more northern soils, uh, how it would be possible to break up the root. Not going to be possible to to use one of those uh, deep plows to do it. So that would be that would be my concern in in some areas in Canada. Okay. Um... Next question, does the, the fungus stay in the roots for a while after an infected tree is cut down? Yes, the transmission can happen for, I believe it's up to a, a, you know, a couple of years after the tree's actually cut. So, so that's why it's not enough just to cut the trees. Okay, sorry, I'm just trying to work through all the questions here. We've got lots mm -hmm. still coming in. Um, would the cost of research be a component of your total cost analysis? Right, that would be another source that we uh, could have included. Yeah, that. You know, if you were starting to, if you're going to you know, list every uh, or try to account for every source, that would be another economic cost that could be involved. Typically, it's quite small compared to some of these other costs that we're talking about. Okay, um, and was there any treatment for the disease? Yeah, did I did. I mentioned, uh, sorry, what's that? Sorry, go ahead. I wasn't sure if you already covered like, that. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess there are various things that can be done in the event of oak wilt showing up. Not, you know, the first one, as I mentioned, is getting rid of 
any of the materials that have been infected by oak wilt. But you know, as far as treatment goes, uh, I, I think I'd mentioned in the talk this fungicide called propylcanazole, which is really, uh, to my knowledge, the main treatment per se. And it's it's important to note that it doesn't. I guess it's considered more of a therapeutic, so it doesn't stop a tree. It doesn't prevent a tree from actually getting the uh, the disease, but it lessens the symptoms and it lessens the mortality rate. Perfect. Um, so I might just try and um, fit in one more question here and then if we haven't been able to um, follow up with all of the questions we can definitely follow up with everyone later. If we haven't been able to get to your question we can uh, follow up with you after. Um, would you compare um, the effects of oak wilt to emerald ash borer? Yeah, um, okay, that's a good question. I, I, I haven't yet, so I, I need to give it a little bit of thought, but sort of off the top of my head. Um, it does seem, they, they're, they're definitely different, different creatures. Uh, you know, EAB, spread very quickly and it attacked sort of I mean I think there was maybe a little bit of variation across ash species but for the most part it attacked all ash species um, and you know to a large extent is able to pretty much remove ash from the landscape um, in areas that it's moved through rather rapidly i think i think in the case of oak wilt with there being a lot of variation between how how uh, you know damaging the impacts are across those two different species groups um and the fact that it it moves slower and, and more sporadically than emerald ash borer i think there's more hope that it's not going to you know remove oaks entirely from the landscape um, it's a slower process, and it's it's less um, it involves less less uh, deterministic outcomes. We we would expect more trees to survive. Um, unfortunately, for well, I guess I've got this Sault Ste. Marie centric perspective, but but I, I guess um, you know red species in the red oak group, red oak in particular, Quercus rubra is is in that group that would be quite sensitive to it. So certainly, you know, in some regions, it it could have the same level of devastating impact as an as an emerald ash borer. But I think overall, there'd be more hope that that uh, that the oak resource wouldn't be completely destroyed. Thanks, John. Um, so maybe I'll do one last question here. Um, so the ecosystem services calculation is quite interesting and demonstrates that the contribution of oak to the environment is very important and outweighs the timber value and street tree component. It is not part of our recent, most recent publication. Um, do you intend to publish those results? Well, we did actually include it in the, in the publication, um, but not, we included it perhaps strangely enough in, in the discussion. Um, so it is there, but it wasn't sort of featured as as um, sort of as one of the main impacts that we looked at. But we did we did want to include it as almost more of a proof of concept. Uh, you know, I hope it was clear from from what I showed in the talk that you know there's a lot of estimation going on there. Um, we didn't put error bars on those estimates but they'd undoubtedly be quite large so we didn't feel you know 100 percent comfortable putting them as as uh as a result per se in that paper but they are there as proof of concept in the discussion and you know perhaps we're being too too uh too concerned with 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 uh how precise we're able to be with the estimates i know people do this kind of thing you know there, there are plenty of people who just provide um ecosystem related costs um but i guess you know because it was sort of our first time dipping into that water we uh, we wanted to present it with some caution
Thanks, John. Okay, I think we'll we'll wrap up the question period there. Um, and if there's any that we didn't get to or um, you need further clarification on, we can definitely follow up with you after. Um, so I just wanted to thank John again for presenting today and thank everyone for tuning in. Um, this webinar was recorded, so it will be available on our Invasive Species Center uh, website. And we would really appreciate if you could take a couple minutes to fill out the survey um, at the end and stay tuned for future webinars. So thanks again, John, and uh, I hope everyone has a has a great day. Thanks, Madison. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank <laughs> you.